I'm just going to ask Janice to come up and introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Lloyd. Those were invaluable pearls. I'd like to introduce Dr. Ruth Williams and invite her to this stage. She is a glaucoma specialist. You may also know her because she's also the president of the Wheaton Eye Clinic in Illinois and is presiding executive officer of the clinic, which provides care to over 140,000 patients annually. She served as past president of the academy in 2012, and she is a mentor and role model to many leaders here in the room. Dr. Williams. Thank you so much. This is the best gig of the whole weekend, and thank you to the organizing committee for asking me because um, I love being with young ophthalmologists. One of the rules that a senior ophthalmologist in my practice taught me a long time ago was to always hire uh, new young ophthalmologists who are smarter, smarter than I am and better trained than I am. And I can tell you that's what we do, and I can tell you it's actually pretty easy to do. And our practice has been transformed by a growth mod model that hires new young people out of residency and fellowship. First of all, how do you find the right practice? And there are a couple important points. Um, I, I, I'm, I hesitated to say this, but it's so true. You have to be in practice for 30 years before you start realizing this, that um, joining a practice is a little bit like a marriage in a lot of ways. You make a commitment, and there are good times and bad times, and there are certain values that carry you through. Your colleagues, maybe if I only had one point for my whole talk, it would be the first one. You continue to grow as a clinician and as a human being hanging around with the other ophthalmologists with whom you practice. It's amazing how much they affect you. So I would say maybe the most important fit is to hang around with people that you respect and you want to be turn out to be like those people. It's a multi-year relationship. And I would have been mad if someone said this to me when I was a yo, but it's very true. You will spend more time with your colleagues than you spend with your spouse and kids and friends. So you better like them and you better respect them. Um, so why is fit important? Because our values really matter. I want to work in a practice, and I know you do too, that reflects your values, gives you the freedom to live them out and apply them, and gives you the, the, the uh, the freedom really to grow as a human being and for your values to grow and deepen. Um, the quality of your work life is really important. We spend so much time and what your experience is while you're there all day matters a lot. Um, I can say in my practice it's upbeat and cheerful and respectful and I'll tell you that my favorite thing about where I practice we're a group of 30 ophthalmology subspecialty people, and I can go across the room, across the hall, knock on the door, and ask someone to look at a retina with me or look at a visual field or, you know, check this pupil out. I probably do it 10 times a week. And I've learned so much from that, and I'm a better clinician because of it, and I provide better care. I don't have to get a consult. I can call my colleague over. Um, another reason fit is important is our work can be incredibly rewarding and fun. We have fun together. I'm so glad. In fact, when I, when I first came, we were a little serious, but some of the young ophthalmologists have come in and um, just infused our place with a little sass, and I kind of like that. One of our young ophthalmologists is uh, uh, a fashion maven, and she comes in with wild shoes, and we love it. It's great. So, you know, I'm going to say what is a good fit for me. Your list might be different, but this is a really interesting list for me to put together. So I would start thinking about what makes it a good fit for you. First of all, I want colleagues I trust and respect. I want a practice that's providing a very high level quality of care, and I want to contribute to that. I want the freedom to practice the way I want for me personally, um, a lack of freedom would be if someone told me how many patients I had to see in a day. If they defined that for me and expected me to plow through that, that would not be the kind of freedom that I want. Um, some people don't care about this, but it's something you should think about. Do you want to be an owner 
of your practice? Or are you happy to be an employee? I can tell you for me, I wanted to be an owner because I want to drive the ship myself or be a part of the team that drives the ship. Um, I love Chicago. It's the best city in the whole world. And it's near a big airport because I also love to travel. Another thing I like is time off of work. So we're structured in a way as we can take off as much time as we want. So um, unfortunately, I have a horrible boss, and um, her name is Ruth, and she doesn't let me off as much as I'd like. Uh, your practice needs to have access to patients, so somebody in the background needs to be doing really good contracting and uh, be paying attention to the milieu of the healthcare systems in the neighborhood and make sure that hey, you're going to have the patients there to see, that they can see you. The culture I've mentioned, and the last two things are super important. What is the sustainability of the practice that you're looking at? Are they still going to be around in five years when these narrow networks get a little stricter and ACOs cultivate and develop? And the last one, which I would have never thought of asking, but I would ask, is what's the governance structure? Meaning, how does this group make decisions and can I be part of it? Super important. So this is why fit is more important than finances, but I would like to comment that finances do matter and they matter a lot. And we had a whole bunch of slides on the other things and a couple short points on finances. First of all, when you get a contract, the salary on that contract is the very least important number of the contract. We tell our, we, in fact, we only guarantee a salary for one year for our new, new young ophthalmologist, and, and I tell them every year, you're going to be fine. Don't worry about the salary. Just ignore it. And um, it's really hard for people to accept that, but it's true. Number one, I think there should be transparency of the process. So how is your salary determined? Um, you know, what, what goes into it? And then what are the expectations of the path? Are you going to be on the same salary forever? Are you going to be on production? And can you become a partner? And I think the number one thing that disenfranchises young ophthalmologists is the lack of the clear expectations of what your path are. I can't tell you how often young ophthalmologists get in five years and they're saying, hey, I want to become a partner, and there's a blank look on the other side. You need to ask up front, you know, where is this going and what are my opportunities? And finally, be bold. And I think maybe not when you're, if you're an employed physician for the first few years, but if you're becoming a partner of a group, you need to know that there are budgets, that the practice has, has budgets and not just makes them, but actively manages them. You need to know if your practice has debt. And you also need to know about cash reserves. And um, in our group, we have totally transparent books. So if anybody wants to come and look at them, they're completely wide open, even for people who aren't partners. We'll let you look at them. And I'm going to say one more thing about finances. This wasn't on my slide deck, but I actually thought of it sitting down here. You know, there's a lot of uh, media right now about how women are paid less than men, 74 to 78 cents on the dollar. And I think that's a huge problem for every single one of us in a room. And it occurred to me sitting right here that if I were a young ophthalmologist and a, a woman and being interviewed, I would say, you know, women get paid 74 to 78 cents on the dollar. I want to make sure that you're paying me a dollar and not 78 cents. Can you, you know, can you answer that for me? And you may or may not get an answer, but it's a really important thing to highlight and to make people think about. People don't do those things on purpose. They do them for subtle reasons. So if you highlight it, it helps. Let me go back. There we go. Uh, Dr. Lloyd taught me this. What's the number one people reason people pick a practice? It's your spouse and where your spouse wants to live. And location's important, and as you get a family, believe it or not, the extended family around actually really matters. So here's my suggestion in closing of what I'm going to recommend you do when you're looking at a practice or even before. I would make a list of all the things that matter to you. What are my priorities for a practice? 
And don't put them in order. The order doesn't matter. Just getting it on paper. By the way, putting things on paper is so much more powerful than just thinking them. And then I would also make a list of my dream practice. In my dream practice, these are all the things I would like. And you won't get them all. So when you actually come down to looking at a potential practice, you can make a pro and con list of the practice. And I can't tell you how clarifying a, a, a discipline like this can be. And the last thing is to know what your non-negotiables are. What are the things that you absolutely won't do no matter how great the job looks? We all should have them. Thank you for inviting me, and good luck to all of you. Thank you very much. Ruth, we got one quick question here. We got a question here. Introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Chin Wei. I'm um, in residency in Washington, D.C. So I know you said to address the, the question, especially being a woman. I mean, that's very important to me. You said to address it and ask, are you, just to confirm that you're getting the dollar to to the man's dollar and you're not being shortchanged at all. How do you um, suggest addressing that? Because that's a sensitive subject, especially when you're starting a practice. You don't want to seem like money, this, like uh, the salary is the most important thing to you and that you're money hungry. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's, I, money is a touchy subject and I was just wondering if how you recommend. Money is not a t touchy subject when you're applying for a job okay. because you know, you're getting paid and where you start matters. And you know, one of the one of the income discrepancies that persists is because people start at different levels and it, you know, it stays that way. Um, be direct and don't accuse anybody. These inequalities are not there because anybody meant them to be there. It just happened for complex reasons, part of which is how women have been taught and socialized to act. So, you know, we all do it together, so we all solve it together. We got here together, we solve it together. Great question. Don't forget, women more than men fail to counter for an initial salary negotiation, and they take the money they're offered, and that's a big part of that 74 to 78 percent number. Men more often will counter. Women can counter, too. I recommend the book, Women Don't Ask. It's in the second edition, and there's a follow-up workbook. Women Don't Ask. You can get it on Amazon. But you're going to now. Thank you very much, Dr. Wade. Give him a hand.